Happy Friday, everyone. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch. Thank you so much for joining me here today. This is this is a real tough case because um, I really feel for the mother of the victim in this case. I can see how hard she's working to keep raising exposure to this case. She's going from major television shows all the way down to YouTubers where she's gaining just a couple hundred views. She's just doing everything she can to try to figure out what happened to her son. Let me go ahead and bring up an image of him real quick. This is Ryan Singleton, aspiring model and actor until 2013 when a tragic occurrence took him away from us all. And that's the mystery today. And is it as simple as the story that we're hearing time and time again being repeated by mainstream media? Is there another theory or more than it, just one other theory that we should consider? That's what we're going to do on today's episode of Brain Scratch. So uh, let me start just with a shot. This is his mother, Iris Flowers, on the Dr. Oz show. Um, I'll have this clip in the description box below, as well as a bunch of different video where you can see uh, his mother speaking and trying to raise exposure to this case. But you can see this is a woman that is really heartbroken. And I've watched several interviews with Iris at this point, And I have to say, this seems like just a really kind and big hearted woman. Whenever she talks about her son, Ryan, uh, you literally just see her light up from inside. Her, her, her love for her son is obvious, but also her pain in not knowing what happened to him is obvious. And something I'm worried about is a theory that she seems to strongly subscribe to might actually be even more painful. Is the truth out there for her to discover so she could possibly let go of that theory and believe something else? I, I really don't know. Um, this is such a tough case because we're talking a very limited amount of physical evidence. But what is the story? Let's go ahead and start in a very strange place for an episode of Brain Scratch. This is the IMDb profile for Ryan Singleton. And pretty much his profile is blank except for one project, uh, which we'll talk about by the end of this, uh, and his biography. And here's what's written in his biography. Ryan Singleton, a 24-year-old aspiring writer and filmmaker, left his home in Atlanta, Georgia for what was supposed to be a weekend trip to Los Angeles in early July 2013 and hoped to jumpstart his acting career. On July 6, 2013, Ryan Singleton rented a car and drove to Las Vegas. On his return trip to Los Angeles, the vehicle broke down in the Mojave Desert on July 9th, and two California Highway Patrol officers spotted him walking on the road, picked him up, and dropped him off at a rest stop or a convenience store near Baker, California. And I now know that that is an AM PM. Uh, if you've ever done the drive between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, there's a very good chance that you've probably stopped at that AM PM yourself in Baker. Uh, Singleton called a friend to pick him up, but that friend was a three hour drive away. Singleton made a purchase and walked outside the store and vanished. When his friend arrived, Singleton was nowhere to be found. A missing persons report was filed. On September 21st, 2013, Ryan's body was found by two joggers, hikers, with his heart, lungs, kidney, liver, and eyes missing about two miles from the convenience store where he was last seen in an area that had been extensively searched by detectives and investigators. So... As you can tell um, from this very brief version of the story, there's a huge mystery here in how is his body found and specifically why are those organs and his eyes missing? And of course, many of you out there are probably thinking of organ trafficking or some form of that. We've all heard these kind of urban legend stories, uh, and don't get me wrong, organ trafficking is certainly real, but the popular urban legend that we hear about is you're at a bar somewhere, you have something to drink, you pass out, you wake up in a bathtub that's filled with ice with a letter that says call 911 and there's a phone right next to the bathtub and you call 911 and you find out that there's a, a surgical scar in your back and one of your kidneys has been taken. Um, now that's the urban legend version of it. There's a much more real an almost darker truth to um, organ harvesting that 
does occur. And some people debate, does it really happen here in the US or not? According to some information I found from some experts, it seems like, yes, it does happen here in the US. And it happens in major hospitals. There's um, there's just this dark underworld of organ harvesting that is a whole other aspect we're really not going to push too far into for this episode, but just know that you can find a lot of information about that. I will include one link down below to a Newsweek article that will give you a good start in terms of understanding some of the logistics of that. But when we're talking about this particular case, Ryan, out in the middle of the desert, is that a location where you're really going to have some type of organ harvesting going on. That is certainly part of the, the question here on today's Brain Scratch. But let's go ahead and continue with an article at WTSP.com where we can learn a little more about Ryan and about the events leading up to whatever happened out uh, in the desert. I'm glad that he did go. He took the courage and he went. He was brave. Ryan was never afraid to try anything. He was never afraid most things he tried, he mastered, said his mother, Iris Flowers. Iris remembers her son's journey to stardom. At 21 years old, Ryan left his mother's home in Georgia for New York City to pursue his dream of becoming a model. With her son being miles away for the first time, she was as nervous as any parent would be. Iris followed her son on social media to keep up with his latest ventures. She remembers the day she felt all his hard work wasn't in vain. He landed a spot on the runway during New York's Fashion Week. Soon, Ryan set his eyes on Hollywood. He aspired to become an actor and pursue film production. He and a group of friends packed their belongings in a U-Haul truck and left New York for Los Angeles. They documented their cross-country journey. Ryan eventually decided to leave his production team in Los Angeles and head back to New York. He married celebrity stylist Kyth Brewster. Flowers found out about her son's nuptials on Facebook. Uh, supposedly, she also found out that her son was gay by seeing that he had married a man on Facebook. She, apparently, she did not know that previously. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit of, of, of things I just want to get in here. First of all, him leaving the production team in Los Angeles, I've only seen one small hint that that was due to some type of disagreement that he had with the friends that he had gone out there with. I have no idea what that disagreement is about. Uh, I don't know how bad that disagreement could have been when he essentially winds up going back out to Los Angeles to visit for this short period of time. Um, but that already raises one of the questions. Why are you going to fly out to Los Angeles, then rent a car, and then drive to Las Vegas? And he was talking about only being out there for literally a matter of about two to three days. That's really not a lot of time. And that drive from Los Angeles to Las Vegas depending on how you do it, it could take probably anywhere from four, if you're really a bit of a maniac driver, to more realistically six. Could even get a little longer if you're trying to drive during high traffic times. Um, so, you know, you're going on a two or three day trip and you're auto automatically chunking out 10 to 12 hours of your time just on this drive to Las Vegas. A lot of the motivation here, I just, I still don't have a clear understanding of. I don't know why why wouldn't you just fly to Las Vegas if that was where you were going to go? And there's some other information we're going to bump into that maybe there was even a third state involved in all this as well. Now, the story that his mom hears is apparently he's going to meet with uh, a football team for some reason. Again, I don't know why. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of backstory, so I'm just giving you guys the details as I've bumped into it. So he has a falling out with his production team. Uh, I don't know at what point he meets Kyth Brewster. Kyth Brewster is a celebrity stylist, um, but he does meet him. They get married and live in New York for a period of time, but it is a very short marriage. Let's go ahead and continue with the article here. Just four months later, Ryan and Kyth separated. Ryan moved back in with his mother in Georgia who sensed something was wrong. Iris remembered a conversation she had with her son. Something bad is going to happen to me, isn't it? Ryan asked his mother. Ryan, what are you talking about? She responded. Iris asked her son if he owed someone money, and he said no. I've done a lot of things to hurt a lot of people, Ryan replied. Here's a picture of them together. 
I don't know if he felt some kind of way because he left the production team, married Kythe, and it didn't work out with Kythe, and now he's home. He knew he hurt me by disappearing and not communicating with me. Anybody outside of that, I couldn't figure out who it could be. Two days later, Ryan abruptly left for Los Angeles again. And here they have a timeline of events. Um, we've already touched on some of the some of the um, aspects in terms of his previous career. So we're just going to pick it up from July 2013. Tells his mom he's going to Las Vegas to try out for a football team. Based on some other information I've seen, apparently that is the Arizona Cardinals. So why is he driving? Why is he flying to Los Angeles, then driving to Vegas? I, I don't know, but it has to do with the Arizona Cardinals, apparently. July 9th, 2013, Ryan calls his mother in the morning asking her to send him $100 via Western Union to Nevada. July 9th, 2013, mom receives a call from Kaif, Ryan's estranged husband. Mother tells Kaif that Ryan is on the West Coast. Kaif tells mother that Ryan called him and it seemed he had been drinking Kaith tells Iris that Ryan's life could be in danger. Now, we have a very strong statement there that unfortunately we don't have a lot of understanding what the basis is for. I don't know if it's related to the fact that Kaith thinks that Ryan has been drinking. Um, is there potentially some type of substance abuse? I don't know. I've looked into some other information about what might have been going on with Kaith and Ryan's relationship. Um, and some of the things I'm hearing seem like warning indicators for some pretty severe substance abuse that one or both of them uh, could have been dealing with. So I have a feeling that Kaith might have taken Ryan's drinking as a bit of a precursor to that could lead to other things that are really bad for Ryan. But I don't know that for a fact. It could be something else totally different. It could be that Kaith knows that there's someone out on the West Coast that wanted to harm Ryan for some reason or something along those lines. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information. And uh, Iris really doesn't have good contact with Kaith going forward. So we don't get a clarification from her in terms of that. I've also seen notes from several of the publications here that have reached out to Kaith directly, and he does not respond to them. So not a lot more that we can get from that. But back to the timeline. July 9th, 2013, mother speaks with Barstow County detective who told her Ryan was seen walking down the highway at 2 p.m. by California Highway Patrol. Ryan tells deputies his car broke down. Deputies took Ryan to look for the car, but couldn't locate it. Uh, and let me just point out, that's a little bit strange. Uh, everything out there is pretty much centered around uh, one highway. So kind of strange to me. They couldn't find the car. Um, they, they do locate the car. We'll get to that, but not on the day when they actually have Ryan and they're looking for it. Uh, the deputies took Ryan to the closest town, Baker, where they dropped him off at the convenience store, the AMPM. Deputies said Ryan made a purchase walks out of the store and vanishes. Uh, July 10th, 2013, Ryan's car is found in Barstow County, a few miles north of where deputies and Ryan initially searched for the car. July 11th, 2013, the case was assigned to another detective who informed Iris that her son was receiving money from multiple people. Apparently, he also called a friend in the LA area, asked him to get him some money. This friend deposited money into Ryan's account for him. I think that amount is only $60. Um, but yeah, certainly seems like Ryan is scratching up funds. I'm also wondering if the car really broke down or did he potentially run out of gas? I mean, you know, he's having his mom wire a hundred bucks that he keeps, you know, in, in his room. He's calling up another friend to wire him, wire him 60 bucks kind of sounds like he's strapped for cash, which is just another strange thing about this whole trip. Why are you doing that drive if you don't have enough cash? Or did he have cash and then he got to Las Vegas? Did he gamble it and lose it all or something along those lines? Uh, we don't have detail. I'm just, I can only speculate. Uh, September 21st, 2013, Ryan's body is found by two joggers, hikers, with his organs missing about two miles from the convenience store where he was last seen. This is within the five mile radius that authorities intensively searched. Now, uh, you know, looking into as many cases as I have, um, this is not uncommon to have a body found in a location that was supposedly previously searched. And keep in mind, we're talking about severe desert area. 
Um, this is some of the nastiest desert that you could be in. It is wicked hot. I, I can't think of many times that I was driving through there that the temperature gauge on the car wasn't registering over 100. It can get ridiculously hot out there. And you're, you're doing a search with the local authorities. How many people is that really out in that type of area? The town of Baker is only a, a population of about 400 people. So even if they got the local authorities, they got some highway patrol authorities, I can't imagine they had more than 10, maybe 12 people, something along those lines, and trying to search a five, uh, five mile area. This is not the same as a search where you know you have 200 volunteers showing up and people are literally walking side by side doing grid search i don't think that's the type of search that happened here so this other element people love to bring this up in these stories because it really makes these stories extra clickable and it's another creepy factor but this element that oh it was within the five mile radius that was searched intensively i can't I just, I don't think that that search is really that intensive when we're talking about uh, the authorities, the local authorities only, and there being no type of, uh, you know, group of volunteers or search organizations coordinating with them or, or things of that nature. Uh, I believe that they did the best job they could. They probably ran up and down the highway. They probably looked at some of the roads that shoot off of the highway and maybe drove a couple of those. Um, but even just to be out, in the sun for for a serious amount of time out there, it's it's really really risky. So I would really question what type of search they did there. I don't even know if they would have even taken out ATVs or something like that to actually get off the roads a little bit just out in the desert area. Um, it's I just I don't know for a fact. But let's take a look at the area here. This is the AMPM that uh, many of you might recognize if you've come through Baker and. This is what it looks like from the top. Uh, let me just go ahead and drop down to the street level because I want to show you guys uh, what type of terrain we're talking about out here. So you can see once you get past, here's the AMPM and the Arco station. On the other side of that, you've got the highway. You can see a couple of the cars there. And that's it. You have desert. Just tough, tough terrain. A lot of low shrubbery. Um... It is just, it is a very, very tough place to try to take on the elements. So certainly one of the things that we have to wonder about here is, was it the elements? Did the elements take him out? I mean, we know that he is seen sometime around two o'clock when the police pick him up. I mean, we're getting right into late afternoon. Uh, admittedly, it might be just a little bit cooler then than it is sometime around noon, but we're talking serious conditions a lot of heat, uh, very high chance of some type of dehydration. And when people start getting dehydrated, they can do some very strange things. Uh, even the fact that he left the AMPM, I don't know why. The AMPM is open 24 hours a day there. And he had to wait three hours for this ride that was coming to pick him up. Why wouldn't you have just stayed at the AMPM? And apparently he had enough. He was able to buy something. Um, just hang out there for the three hours. Unfortunately, he didn't. For some reason, he gets, I've heard varying numbers, but somewhere between uh, a mile and a half to two miles away from the AMPM is ultimately where his where he's found. Now, I, th I would think possibly he was trying to get back to the car, uh, maybe if dehydration did kick in. And keep in mind, we also don't know, uh, we have his ex-husband saying that it seems like he had been drinking. So if he if you add alcohol into this equation on top of that, he could have been extra dehydrated already as it was and then getting exposed out in these elements. Things could have turned really bad really quick. So a lot of things that we have to consider with this case. Continuing at foxnews.com, an article from November 20th, 2013. We see a picture of Ryan here. Uh, two months after the body of an aspiring writer and filmmaker turned up in the California desert, his family is desperate for answers and certain foul play was involved. Tight-lipped investigators have released little information about any progress on the case, and Singleton's family knows little more than they did when he was initially reported missing. I'm waiting for answers, Singleton's mother, Iris Flowers, told Fox News. I'm in a holding pattern right now. Investigators trying to reconstruct Singleton's final hours have told his family they believe he was picked up by a highway patrol officer after his car broke down and driven to the rest stop in Baker. 
Once there, Singleton called the friend who lived three hours away and asked to be picked up, according to the family. But when the friend arrived and could not find Singleton, he reported him missing. The family said authorities have said little to them about what happened to Singleton and have not yet disclosed a cause of death. Singleton's mother and same-sex spouse said they are convinced foul play was involved, but said they are unaware of a possible motive. So trying to run down this thought of a potential foul play scenario, um, I don't know that it would have been someone from his life, some type of long-term enemy or something like that, that would have the opportunity to do this. Keep in mind, we've got California Highway Patrol interacting with him, picking him up, giving him a ride. They're not noting that anyone else was with him. Uh, could it be that someone was following him? Was someone maybe waiting at his car uh, and he gets back to the car and then something happens there? Possibly. I just, I don't know what the feasibility of that is. If the car truly broke down or even if it just ran out of gas, are you going to leave someone with the car in the desert like that without any ability to actually run the air conditioning? Probably not. So um, it's tough. But that can't rule out foul play for me. There could be other situations, uh, crimes of opportunity, uh, which this could still fit into. Someone that came across him, wanted to take advantage of him in some way, and did something to him. But let's go ahead and continue. I don't know anything other than that my son was found with no organs in his body. Flowers said. Now keep in mind at the time that this article is written, Iris did not have access to pretty much any information. She was just being told things from investigators, probably as she was calling to ask for, for updates or being notified about some of their progress. So I almost feel like this was an unfortunate conversation that if it was handled differently, might have not. It, it really seems like she's been scarred. Uh, you, when you see her talk about a, a few quotes in particular, um, she uses the phrasing exact like it was told to her that way, and she goes back to those points over and over and over, and I, I can't imagine. I mean, this was probably the worst day in her life is when she got that phone call, and there are a few pieces of that phone call, I think, that really put her on the belief structure that his organs being taken could have been a motive for his murder. I just don't know that that is accurate. And I don't know that it's helpful to her because if there's something else that could have been going on here, uh, they're not seeing it. There's just, there's no consideration for anything outside of he was basically killed so that someone could take his organs. And there are a lot of other things that could have happened out here um, that don't include that. And those things should be considered as well. And I believe only in considering those things can you possibly get to some level of understanding of as close to the truth as you're going to get. This is a really tough case. I don't I, I don't know that you're ever going to be handed a file folder that says the truth and you can look through it all and you can say, okay, now I understand what the truth is about this case. I think the best that someone could expect in this case is to try to be open to consider everything that could have happened, look at the information that is coming in, and then for yourselves, try to understand what you believe is most likely to have happened here. And is the organ harvesting story the most likely thing to have happened? I, I don't know. For me personally, I'm struggling with it, but we'll talk about some other thoughts uh, before the end of this video about what could have been going on here. Singleton's spouse said, the lack of answers from authorities has led him to question various theories. Was Singleton the victim of an organ theft ring? Was the six foot four inch man described as kind and gentle the victim of a random abduction and murder with his body dumped in a hot desert for wild animals to dismember? Finally, given Singleton's sexual orientation, he wonders if the openly gay man could have been the victim of a hate crime. Certainly another situation that could come up in um, a crime of opportunity like I had mentioned before. So I would wonder that myself. Singleton's spouse said he was certain of one thing, that the 24-year-old did not simply collapse and die in Death Valley. Now that, I also, I see his point and I struggle with that myself. This is a guy that is 24 years old, uh, in good shape. I believe he was working as a lifeguard right before he took this trip. His mom said he was looking healthier than ever, you know, good amount of muscle on this guy. 
So what are the odds that he's going to go walking off in the desert and just fall down and die? Um, could there be an accidental situation that goes on with this? Potentially, could there have been some injury that happened to him uh, that could have incapacitated him and then the elements overtook him? I do think that those things have to be considered as well, but I certainly get what his spouse is saying here that you know he wasn't just walking around and it was too hot and he fell over. Uh, I think that there is probably a more likely chance that something else happened, possibly an accident, possibly something that wasn't an accident. Um, but we'll we'll touch on that as we continue here. I believe that he was taken from there and later put back there, his spouse said. I just don't think he passed out there and was there for two and a half months. And I've already shared with you guys my thoughts on that. I, I think uh, he could have been missed in the search. I, I certainly think that's possible. I've seen it way too many times with my work on this channel. Uh, over at projectq.us, Atlanta mother aches for answers in gay son's mysterious death. This is an article from August 30th, 2016. As the third anniversary of Ryan Singleton's death approaches, his mother, Iris Flowers, knows as little today about the tragedy as she did in 2013 when his body was found by joggers in Baker, California. And that's a frustration she faces every day. It's been a total nightmare, Flowers said. People want to know how I've been so strong. It's God. That's all I can tell you. I've gotten through the last three years with a lot of prayer. Flowers still has few answers. Authorities investigating the case in San Bernardino County won't provide her with an autopsy report or a cause of death or any details at all about the case, since they tell her it remains an open investigation, she said. And she hasn't spoken to Singleton's estranged husband, celebrity stylist Kyth Brewster, since early 2014. I am just dumbfounded. I don't know where to go, who to run to, who to speak to, Flowers said. Of course, you could just feel the desperation in her words. Uh, moving on to a pretty recent article, December 19th, 2018. The mother of a Georgia model whose body was found missing his organs wants to conduct her own forensic investigation into the case. Singleton's body was found about two miles from the gas station. His organs were missing. An autopsy lists the cause of death as undetermined due to advanced decomposition. No one has ever been charged in Ryan's death. So here, we're at least hearing that now we have some information coming from an autopsy report. Uh, let's continue with this article here. It's doing a, a lot of the same coverage we've already gone through. Uh, the autopsy was conducted by the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department Coroner Division in September of 2013. According to the autopsy, two men were walking in the desert west of Baker, California on September 21st, 2013, when they found what happened to be human remains. They called 911. When the body was examined by the deputy coroner on September 22nd, 2013, it was clothed in black shorts, faded black high top court shoes, black socks, and an orange rubber bracelet with Tricamp 2013 etched into it on the right wrist. So almost fully clothed, but no shirt. And I have not heard any information about where his shirt was. Um, we also didn't hear, at least from the California Highway Patrol comments that have made it online, uh, to or through major media, we didn't hear that when they picked him up, he was missing his shirt. So I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, no trauma was noted by the coroner, but he did note several bones appear to have been removed from the body by animal activity. Most of the ribs on the left side had been moved away. The autopsy reports notes that when Singleton was last seen by the highway patrolman, he did not appear to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. The body weighed only 50 pounds when examined by the coroner. It was nearly completely skeletonized. The report makes several references to missing, missing flesh due to animal activity. The report lists a possible hemorrhage on the right side of the skull. Very interesting and could once again lead to uh, at least two of the theories we talked about previously, some type of accident where he struck his head or the potential that he was struck in the head. The cause of death is listed as undetermined to due to advanced decomposition. The manner of death is listed as undetermined, which some people are upset about that as well, because with an undetermined listing, 
Um, it's not the same, obviously, as if it will be listed as a homicide. And I do believe that the resources that are assigned uh, are considerably different for that as well. So it's strange because I've heard his mother talk about this. Um, it's almost like she believes that his body was much more complete than the autopsy report would lead you to believe if you read through that whole thing, which by the way, there's a link to it in the description box below. So you can read through the autopsy report for yourself. I have to say, I was surprised at how much animal activity was referred to in the autopsy report. Um, and I'm surprised that people are still considering that this could be some type of organ harvesting situation with the autopsy report being readily available and readable by anyone that wants to take the time. And it's only four pages long. It's not like it takes you a whole lot of time to get through it. Um, what is clear is the experts that were working on the actual autopsy came to their conclusion that this was uh, animals, that basically his organs are specifically missing because of animals. And if you recall, at the start of this video, I kind of gave you a list of specifically what organs are missing. When you read the autopsy report, uh, the conclusion is pretty much that all the organs were missing. And as a matter of fact, even most of the brain had decomposed. They did find some brain matter. They did run that for some toxicology results. There, It seems like they were testing for, uh, I think, for methamphetamine or, or amphetamines, if I remember correctly. And I'm not sure. It's kind of hard to determine. It's like they had a conclusion where they thought there might have been amphetamines, but then when they ran it for the final test, it came back negative. Um, but outside of that, there was nothing in terms of organs being noted. And I've read several autopsy reports. Uh, the, organ, the organs are gone through meticulously, typically. Individually weighed, um, their status, uh, the, color is, the colorization that is on them. I mean, everything is meticulously noted in autopsy reports. None of that exists in this report because none of those organs are there. Uh, another thing is it seems like his mother is under the assumption that um, that most of his skin was still there. And after reading the autopsy report for myself, it's very, very clear that there are large sections of his skin that is missing. And it seems like in particular on his right side, um, which I believe would have been face down, um, that a lot of that tissue is gone. And one of the things his mother was concerned about is he actually had tattoos, but on the autopsy report, it notes that no tattoos were found. Well, when I read through the autopsy report, it kind of makes sense. I saw in a video where she was referring to one of the tattoos and it was on the right side of his neck. And the autopsy report is very clear about the amount of degradation and the lack of skin in that area. So uh, his mother's assumption is that someone removed the tattoos to try to hide who it was, that they were identifying marks. Um, but I don't know, guys, based off what I'm reading with the autopsy report, it seems fairly clear that uh, animals were just at him. And there's another aspect that uh, the articles haven't really hit on yet, but I've found buried in some other information. When he came up on the highway patrol, he actually told them that he was being attacked by animals out in the desert, just as he was walking back from his car. So I don't think it's incredibly unheard of, but what are other people saying about this? Let's uh, jump to a Reddit thread real quick and read a comment from Hector Abaya. Uh, I'm a cadaver dog handler who often deals with bodies that have been in the elements for weeks or months. This seems pretty consistent with a body being out in the wilderness to me. As others have said, harvesting organs for donation generally requires major surgery that leaves marks on the bone. Scavenging, on the other hand, often targets internal organs first. The scattered ribs and other details are also entirely consistent with scavenging. I can't. I can see why this seems weird to people who aren't familiar with what a few weeks in the elements can do to a body, but there's nothing here that suggests foul play to me. Now, on top of that, even Snopes has kicked up on this. Uh, they have an expert and I've seen in several places where he's spoken about this case in particular. His name is Joseph Scott Morgan. He's an associate professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, and I believe he's a former death investigator as well. Uh, let me check. Uh, yeah, there's a really good podcast. It's called Karis on Crime. I actually listened to uh, 
uh, Beth Karras interview Joseph Scott Morgan. He is a former death investigator, particularly about this case. So if you want to kind of dive into the nitty gritty of the autopsy report a little bit more, uh, check out that link down below for Stitcher. So what does he say about this? He rebuked the possibility of illegal organ harvesting. If that's going to be a procurement event, first off, you have to have a viable way to source the organs and they would be surgically removed. That means that you would have to have smooth margins that indicates a scalpel has opened the body. There's no indication of that. As a matter of fact, there's little or no tissue that's left on the outside of the body. However, officials with both the CHP and the Nevada Highway Patrol told us on the 1st of June 2017 that they have no record of Singleton's interacting with members of their department. An NHP spokesperson said that their officers would not drive anyone across state lines in the manner described by past reports. Now, I'm a little confused about that because uh, Baker is not that close to the state line. The state line is approximately 50 miles away from that. So I don't know what story they're talking about where he would have been taken by a highway patrolman across state lines. That really makes no sense to me. Uh, I think there is a likelihood that the CHP officer that gave him a ride to the AMPM might have not reported this. That's the only thing that seems to make sense to me. Um, I don't know if that's standard practice. I'm just saying I think that's that might be what happened here. And I'm kind of surprised to see uh, Snopes pick up a strange story like this, uh, try to rebuke one aspect of it, and then open up another strange mystery at the end of it. That's not their typical MO, but... That's how it goes with this one. Uh, so I did bump into some articles. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with this website at all. Uh, it's called u.wn.com. From what I gather, it looks like it is reporting that is contributed by anyone. Just anyone can kick up uh, a report of their own and, and write about something here. There is a woman named Sherry Jefferson that has done multiple pieces on this case. Uh, I believe she's an attorney also. Uh, and she seemed to get access to one of the reports that I can't find publicly available. Unfortunately, she talks about the report, but she doesn't provide a link to it or post it herself. So I don't know if she was given this by the family. Just keep in mind, we're getting this secondhand. So the reliability of this information, uh, we got to take it with a grain of salt. Ryan Singleton's coroner's investigative report. And there's a big long number after that, but, um, what was learned from this report? On July 10th, 2013, Ryan Singleton was reported missing. A man named TK filed the report. According to this report, TK is a friend of Ryan. He told authorities that on July 7th, 2013, that Ryan traveled from LA to Las Vegas, but does not disclose the nature of those travels. Once again, guys, I'm really just wondering what was this trip about? If he was going to Vegas, why didn't he just fly to Vegas? Why did he fly to LA to rent a car, to drive to Vegas, when apparently he didn't have really enough money to even finish that trip? Something's very strange about this trip. On July 8th, 2013, Ryan headed back to LA. It appears that Ryan had an Avis rental car. Uh, it appears that on July 7th, that Ryan drove the Avis car from Los Angeles to Arizona and Las Vegas. And even this article is asking, why did he fly into Los Angeles to drive to Las Vegas and Arizona? We learn from page one of the report that on July 8th, 2013, that Ryan called TK, who lived in the Los Angeles area. TK asserts that Ryan told him that he was going to pull over his car and get some rest. He does not state where Ryan pulled over. It appears that TK did not hear from him again until July 9th, 2013. TK alleged that Ryan called him on July 9th, 2013, to state that he was running low on gas. The report does not state the time or Ryan's location at the time of that call. Later that day, TK sent Ryan 60 bucks by deposit depositing it into his bank account. And this article is asking, why does TK have access to a new bank account of Ryan's? Uh, I don't know that it's a new account. Uh, I don't know if this TK is one of his former production buddies. Maybe they had some kind of joint account that they used together or something along those lines. Uh, I don't know that there's a real big mystery about that, but it's an interesting question. How did TK uh, you know, 
put money into Ryan's account. Ryan's mother said that he called her on July 9th at 9.30 Eastern time, which would have been 6.30 Pacific. Ryan requested money and told her not to disclose his whereabouts to his estranged friend, his husband, uh, from New York. Ms. Flowers said that within 10 minutes of the call, she sent him $100 and immediately called him back to provide the Western Union money tracking number. However, he did not answer his telephone and he did not respond to her text messages. She states that she continued to call and text but never received a response. TK claims that at 3.50 p.m. on July 9th, Ryan called him and said that he was in Baker. However, according to the investigative report, Ryan supposedly had a police citizen encounter because his car ran out of gas. The police said that they drove around to locate the car but were unable to find where Ryan had left it. This encounter caused the police to drive him to the AMPM store in Baker. Missing from this report is the date and time of when the patrol officer first encountered Singleton. The patrolman's statement that Ryan did not appear to be under the influence of drugs further confound the autopsy note that while one test, gas test, for amphetamines was negative, another test returned a presumptive positivity. The report claims that Singleton told the officer that he had been attacked by small animals. On July 10th, 2013, Ryan's telephone and backpack were found inside his rental car, which was wiped down. Now, first of all, very strange. How was his phone found in the car? And why would you have left your telephone and your backpack in the vehicle? Uh, if you were looking to get help or to try to find help because your car had broken down. Uh, as a matter of fact, why wouldn't you have used your telephone to try to possibly call for help from where your vehicle was, which maybe he did and we're just not hearing that. But I think the author is making a little assumption here that the vehicle was wiped down. Uh, I've heard some other podcasts on this, and they're basically saying that when police processed the car forensically, they couldn't find any fingerprints on the car. Now, keep in mind, this is a rental car. Uh, I don't know if it could have been detailed. It could have been new. I mean, I had an experience where I literally rented a car just a couple of weeks ago, and it only had like six miles on it. So how many prints would that car have had inside of it? Probably none, but I guess you could assume that it's going to have my prints on it from, from actually using it. Um, but that's not always a guarantee. And uh, is it strange that there was no prints in the car? Yes. Does that mean necessarily that it was wiped down, that there's something wrong going on there? Not necessarily. It could, but I don't think that that is uh, a guaranteed thing. But what is strange is his phone in the backpack being there. Uh, and unfortunately, I really wish I could see this report for myself. Um, but keep in mind, we're getting this information secondhand here. TK claims Ryan had called him to ask for a ride back to LA. If these statements are accurate, how did Ryan's telephone end up in his rental after he was reported missing? Uh, I guess one other possibility could be he had more than one phone. Maybe he had a business phone and a personal phone, something along those lines. I don't know. Uh, another article also written by Sherry, uh, which, by the way, I, I definitely appreciate that she's trying to uh, raise exposure to this case and get this information out, um, raises an interesting note that I also felt about the autopsy report. Uh, contrary to the initial no trauma note, the report found indications of hemorrhaging of the brain. The report includes a fracture line of the skull on the left side, just above the ear, although the autopsy report suggests the fracture was caused by a bone saw during the autopsy. The hypothesis of blunt force trauma is further substantiated by the unnamed deputy coroner's report that one of the sutures of the skull may have been dislocated. The skull is not solid bone. It's not all one piece, but it's several bones that join in what are called suture lines. So, and I did find that very strange myself, even when I was reading it. Um, once again, doesn't tell us exactly, could it have been an attack? Could it have been a fall? But the fact that his skull had separated at one of those suture lines, very interesting to me. Uh, I really haven't heard of that happening in a case before and made me wonder, was there some kind of pressure or something that happened? Um, I don't know. Something very strange about that. And then when you wrap that up with their conclusion that there was some type of hemorrhaging of his brain that had gone on, uh, it sure seems like something happened to his head. And once again, kind of brings me back to that 
um, those theories I was talking about earlier, possibly a fall, possibly an attack, but it does seem like something happened to his head. And it is kind of strange that the autopsy, it doesn't dive into those areas any further. Uh, the only additional information I can think of is uh, it does mention that that fracture line on the left side of the skull probably happened after he was dead already because the brain mass that was still uh, that was still in his skull didn't seep into that crack in the way that it should have if it had happened when it was um, be before that decomposition of the brain had started. So, and Sherry makes a statement here. Despite clear evidence of both a skull fracture and brain hemorrhaging, the coroner ruled the cause of death as undetermined. Um, I still don't know that they could have pushed that to homicide because I still think there is a strong possibility of some type of fall, uh, some type of head injury that could have happened in a fall. That wouldn't necessarily be a homicide. That could be accidental. And I do think that the undetermined classification is there specifically for cases like this. It just isn't clear. This isn't a case where we have uh, bullet fragments that are found and we can see that the, the ribs were chipped by the bullet as it had passed through or knife marks that were found on his bone. This is a case, I think, where it is truly undetermined. And that's one of the things that makes it so tough to look at it and to try to come to some reasonable conclusions about it. Um, there's just not a lot to go on because of what was found. Only 50 pounds of him was found. There is a lot missing. And I, I get why his mother is holding on to that theory. I really truly believe that she needs to understand the motive. And I think that a lot of people would go about looking at this case the same way. We have to look at the motives and try to drill in from there to solve the crime. I just don't know how successful it would be. Um, do we have enemies? Well, he's got a husband he's kind of estranged with. He's got friends he had a falling out with. He mentioned to his mom that you know he's done a lot of bad things to bad people. So yeah, sure, he has enemies. But what are the possibilities? What's the feasibility that one of those enemies was tracking him, able to find him in the middle of the desert there, um, take advantage of this situation, escape the scene, not be seen by anyone, you know, as being with him at any point during any of that? I don't know. Possible, yes, I guess it is possible. But do I really feel like this is an organ harvesting situation? I'm really, really struggling with that aspect. So if you're looking to understand more of this case, I've got all kinds of links for you down below. Uh, the Karis on Crime episode on Stitcher. Uh, of course, the actual autopsy report link is down there. Uh, and this is a poster for what I believe is going to be the documentary. Uh, from what I can understand, I think they're shopping it. I think they're trying to find someone to distribute it. Looks like it's about 10 hours long. They've taken footage of their road trip getting out to California. Um, and I think they're infusing that with aspects of this mystery, uh, about what happened to Ryan, uh, and just so no one is terribly upset. I don't believe that this is an actual photo. Um, it doesn't match the description of, uh, what was found on the autopsy report. Uh, also a couple Reddit threads down below that you can check out as well as a web sleuths thread, uh, also found thanks to web sleuths. Uh, a picture of Ryan and his mom here at his Instagram. Uh, I've got many, many videos for you to review down below, including this one where his mom is interviewed um, by Cinnamon Cinnamon Robinson. Um, just if, if you want to get a very clear understanding of her perspective and a little bit of a dose of that uh, the way she lights up when she's talking about Ryan, this is probably the best video that I've been able to find on that. Uh, of course, the Newsweek article I mentioned before on organ trafficking, the title of it's very clear, organ trafficking is no myth. I just, I don't think that's what we have going on here. And finally, we do have a little bit of an interesting twist and hope and more eyes looking at this case, which I think can only help. How suburban college students hope to solve desert cold case. Students at Elgin Community College are working to solve the mysterious disappearance and death of Ryan Singleton 
in 2013. Singleton's death is the focus of Elgin Community College's inaugural Cold Case Investigations course, launched this semester in partnership with the Cold Case Investigative Research Institute. Students in the class, all studying criminal justice, work as real investigators, interviewing witnesses, reviewing police reports, examining evidence, and digging for clues that might reveal how Singleton died. Uh, you know, that reminds me, one thing I would have been really interested to see, which I didn't bump into here, is some mention of video from the AMPM. Now, I did see in one case where his mom believes that there was a picture of him inside the store. Uh, I don't know that she saw it for herself, but I think she was told about it from investigators. So they they do have some type of photo of him in the AMPM. But it would have been great if they would have had some external cameras and could have kind of tracked where he was walking, where he'd gone off to, and maybe helped their search with that. Um, I don't know. Just a, another thought I had while I was sharing this with you guys. Um, so students working on it. Uh, the class has made some progress since the course began January 12th of 2018. Uh, if the case isn't solved when the semester ends, students will compile a transfer report so the next class can pick up where they left off. Among those taking a keen interest in the class's progress is Singleton's mother, Iris Flowers. She's in frequent contact with the students and even called Wednesday to wish them a happy Valentine's Day. And uh, my heart just goes out to Iris. I, it, it, it's a terrible, terrible case. And I, I hope that no one would take any of this the wrong way, any of the stuff I've talked about today. I just think that her peace is only going to come from the truth. And it was one thing to, like I said, I think a really bad conversation happened early on that literally scarred her. And she cannot get those quotes out of her head about the, the status of her son's body. But since that, and it did take years, right? we, we went through how long that, that autopsy report was not available, but the autopsy report is now available. And it's pretty clear that the experts at least think that it was animals. I think the term animals happens at least four, maybe six different times in that autopsy report. Um, it's not very vague, the, the autopsy report. It's pretty clear that animals are the reason for his organs missing. So if we rule that out as a motive, now we can start looking at other motives. Accident, possibly. Crime of opportunity, possibly. Start looking at that list of potential enemies. Is there any way that someone could have been tracking him? <clears throat> Did he have some kind of app on his cell phone where uh, you know, his husband would know where he was uh, at any point in time? Uh, there's, I do think that there's other aspects to look into, and I think that keeping this story in the realm of the August harvesting angle is taking focus away from investigating those other aspects. I'd be very surprised to hear what these students think and if they're spending much time on the organ harvesting thing at all. I, I kind of doubt it. Um, and I hope I wish them luck. There is nothing I would love more than to do a case cracked where these students at Elgin Community College were able to bust this case. Uh, and I do, I do know there's, there is a big question out there. What happened? And is it possible that it could be answered? Yeah, it is possible, particularly if someone else is involved. It is certainly possible. What do you guys think? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. Thank you so much for spending this time with me on today's episode of Brain Scratch. I appreciate each and every one of you out there. Stay safe, take care, and please come back to Lord & Arts channel on Monday. We're going to have a brand new episode of Case Cracked for you.